Hello, I'm Steven. Steven, I met two minutes ago here at the... We're at Cool Beans Coffee Roast. That was an easy one. See, that was the easy question. But the first episode of Marietta Stories for Season 3 is all about Missy Owens. Do you know who Missy Owens is? I do not know who Missy Owens is. Well, let's just say you're uh, addicted to opioids. What would you do to try to get better? I would go to church. Well, that's one thing, but typically people go to rehab, right? Right. All right, and what do you do after you get out of rehab? Relapse. You're absolutely right. Missy Owens has this whole program, so when you get out of rehab, there's really no place for you to go. What she does is she has a place called The Zone here in Marietta where people can go after rehab to stay clean and sober. That's a great institution. It is. It is. And it's pretty new, but she's looking to take it nationwide. Well, how do we get on board with this? Listen to the podcast and you will find out. We shall. (laughs) Thank you so much, Steve. Bring the museum back to life. You know, people sit out on the front porch hoping people will come by. Go forth and do good. It's insane. I have the most understanding wife in the world. I treat everybody the same thing. Oh, that's the other thing I love about Marietta. It's like a melting pot. You are listening to Marietta Stories. Each week, veteran podcaster Bill Nowicki brings you the heartwarming, interesting, and fun stories from the people that make the community of Marietta, Georgia, a place to call home. Here's your host, Bill Nowicki. Here we have Missy Owen, first interview for season three of Marietta Stories. I'm very excited to have her here. Recently, she's been on a show called Intervention and it focused on some of the challenges we have here in Marietta, and I want to get to know her a little bit better. So welcome to Marietta Stories, Missy. Thank you for having me, Bill. Your first podcast. Yes, my first podcast. <laughs> Great. You could tell your kids. I'm sure they listened to quite a lot of them. But anyway, where did you grow up? I grew up in a little town southwest of here called Carrollton, Georgia. Where is that located? It's about uh, 45 minutes to an hour outside of Marietta. Okay, so it it would be considered like Atlanta? (laughs) Greater Atlanta? No. Eh. (laughs) It's just a little town where West Georgia College, now I think University of West Georgia is, and um, Southwire is the big industry there, and... So what was your life like uh, growing up? I like a fairy tale. Lived in a beautiful home with a beautiful family, one mom, one dad. Um, They were together 50 years, 50 plus years, almost 55 when he passed. It was just a beautiful life. And what what was a normal day for you like as a kid? I lived two doors down from the high school. So I could get up and go to the high school, and I would walk every day. You know, of course, I can tell my kids I walk through rain and sleet and snow and all that stuff, and they wouldn't realize it was just two doors down. But it was a great life. The little church that we had was, um, you know, a couple miles away. My dad was an attorney there. His office was up on the square, so we might play around on the square. That was back when everybody played in their yards. Everybody knew everybody, and it was just a small, wonderful, leave-it-to-beaver town. Great. Now, how did you end up in Marietta? Well, when I was, oh, I guess in my early 20s, I moved up to Kennesaw because I got a job at Kennesaw Elementary and stayed there for three years before I moved, stayed there four years before I moved to Big Shanty, elementary and then I went to Hayes Elementary and um, spent 26 years there and finished my career with 33 years in education in Cobb County but in Kennesaw. When the zone opened, which I know we'll talk about later, but when the zone opened it was um, the place for it to be was in Marietta and that's just where the need was. So tell me about your your family, the one you created. My family began, we established the Owen family in 1990, December 21st. Five kids, then 27 years later, here we are. Tell me about your sons, Davis. Davis was my firstborn son. 
Um, he has a sister that's older than him, but he was the firstborn son. He was the one that would carry on the family name and, you know, the the one that stole his grandfather's eye and, you know, just um, he was my son. He was my child. How was his childhood? Was it, was it similar to what you experienced growing up? Exactly. I mean, it, it was just a beautiful family. We had a beautiful family. The kids had everything they needed and most of what they wanted. Um, they had any kind of experience. They grew up in the Cobb County school system, and um, he was a baseball player, played East Cobb baseball, you know. Pl- he was a wrestler. He did everything that all the little kids did, you know. Um, he was a member of the First Baptist Church of Marietta, and then we switched over to the First United Methodist Church of Marietta. But he went on to high school, and he was got very involved in student government. And in student government, he was a freshman volunteer, a sophomore senator. He was the junior class president, as a senior class president, he went on to deliver the graduation speech to over 3,000 people at graduation day. He was the editor-in-chief of the yearbook. He was Hall of Fame for Kennesaw Mountain for the class of 2011. He was everybody's friend. The kid didn't have an enemy, and he was just a very smart, you know, gifted, amazing person. Tell me the story about how he got involved in drugs. Davis was very stressed between high school and college that summer, between high school and and college, was just very stressful for him. And he went to the medicine cabinet trying to find something to sleep or, you know, some way to relax and and get some relief and found a old bottle of Vicodin that said may cause drowsiness. And that's where the drug addiction began. It's funny how that one instant or one thing can start uh, a life to go down a whole different path. So how did it progress from there? I think that, you know, there's a a book called uh, Pleasure Unwoven. It's not a book. It's a DVD, actually, and it was written by Kevin McCauley, who is a renowned doctor and who had the disease of addiction. Kevin McCauley says that one in 10 people will take that opioid medication, and they have a genetic predisposition unlike the other nine. And those people have a euphoric experience that just demands to be repeated. And he was one of those kids. You don't realize how quickly and how powerfully the addiction can begin. And once you get to that point, it's almost the point of no return. As parents, did you suspect anything? Um, Not for a long time, no, because you can be very functional on opiate medication. For a long time, we didn't have a clue. And then when we did understand what was going on, the misconceptions that we had about addiction and, you know, the fact that if you go to rehabilitation and you come out, you're well. Opioid medication just does not respond to treatment like that. It's a a process and it's a long process and it becomes a lifestyle and recovery is real. Recovery can happen And it can happen to anybody, but it is something you have to work at, and you work at it for the rest of your life. You have to understand, Davis was in treatment when he got out, and we thought he was doing so well. Six months, six weeks later, he was gone. And, you know, in doing the research to figure out what we needed to do, we found out that if you spend a month or less in a rehab center, that you're 32 times more likely to come out and die than if you'd never gone to treatment in the first place because you've lowered your tolerance, but you didn't allow your brain time to heal. So you might take the same amount you took before you went in, and then you're overdosed. That's right. Wow. So to, if you don't mind sharing the story, <clears throat> I think this might help people. What, what was that whole period of your life like? 
What was it like? We were hopeful. We were very hopeful. He looked so good. You know, it, it's um, it was, it's always been amazing to me when I think back about it, the transformation in just a month's time that the body can repair itself coming off of opioid addiction and into recovery. He looked like a beautiful new human being. His eyes were bright again. He had gained like 20 pounds. Um, he just, his hair was shiny. He was, he was beautiful. There was no, no sign of addiction whatsoever. And so it was easy to look at him and think he's well and not, not understanding addiction because we'd never had any reason to understand addiction before he got addicted. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't have the knowledge that we needed to understand the disease and that's probably one of the biggest problems of all when you when you find out that you have somebody in addiction it's too late to do your research because you're so busy trying to chase right. that person it's almost like they've been given a terminal disease if they don't turn it around so you're mm -hmm chasing after them to make sure that they're not with the wrong people or they're not, you know, in places they shouldn't be or they're not passed out somewhere or they're not in a car accident. And it almost becomes a, an obsession to chase that person instead of learning what you need to learn to be able to help them. You're just trying to save them. Wow. Yeah. That, oh, that's a lot. Let's, uh, Talk to some of the parents that might be out there and might have questions about whether or not their child has an opioid addiction or might be might be going through something similar to you, what you guys went through. What would you tell them to do? I would say learn everything you can about the disease. After Davis died and we knew that we needed to do something, we just began reading every article that was out there, every article, everything everybody had ever written we read stories from people who had be, been addicted and now were in recovery. We learned everything that we could. And what we found out was the biggest gap of all, the biggest service gap of all, was in aftercare. When Davis was in rehabilitation, he was doing great. He had that formal connection. He had that social connection with the people that were there. He had the support. He had the resources at his fingertips. And then once he got out, we thought that he was well. He looked fantastic. I went back to work. My husband went back to work. The kids went back to school. And Davis was left alone in isolation every single day because there was nowhere in Cobb County for him to go and connect in a safe and sober environment that supported recovery. Right. There was no day facility where he could just go and people there knew what he was going through, knew where he was. There were no recovery coaching per se that you could walk into. You could get it, but you had to make an appointment and, you know, whatever. So it became very evident that a recovery community center was needed. You know, same thing with incarceration. You, you go through incarceration at Cobb County Detention Center, and you get up in the morning, you have your breakfast, you know, you've got that routine, you've got those people all around you. And, you know, having worked in the jails over the past couple of years now, the camaraderie in, in the jail because of people being together with a lot of the same issues – all the time and then when you leave that setting there's nothing nothing that's what we knew we had to do and what year was that and how long after you lost davis we got the keys to the building in july of 2016 and that was two years and four months after he had died it sounds like you must be a force of nature to go from where you were to get the money, the support, and I'm, I'm sure there's all kinds of rules and regulation, grants. Had you ever done anything like that before? No, but when God asks you to do something, he provides the way and the people and the 
forces for you to be able to do that. And that's exactly what happened with us. God said, this is what I want you to do. We said, okay. And he laid the path out. Mm. I could spend hours telling you about the miracles that happened along the way. Give me one. Give you one. Uh, I have this little building picked out. It maybe had three rooms in it. And I thought, this could be the zone. We could probably afford this. And, you know, if um, money didn't come through, then Michael and I could pay the bills and we'd be good. And, you know, had that safety net all planned out to fall back into. And Michael's riding down the street and he passes this building, the zone. And he calls me up and he said, I found the center. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I found the center. And I said, okay, when are you going to let me see it? And he said, well, I'll come get you. So he did. We came over here. We drove by. This was 21,000 square feet. And I'm sitting here thinking, it says for sale. It doesn't say anything about being leased. But I called the real estate person that was on it. And he said, you know what? All I can do is ask. A year later, we were sitting in the zone. So did you lease? Are you leasing? We are leasing. Uh, where are you guys located? What's the address? The address is 32 North Fairground Street, Northeast, Marietta, Georgia, 30060. Okay, and it's real close to the square, probably a mile, in, or, mile it, or so. It's at the intersection of um, Fairground and Russell Street. Right. So everybody, just down from the big chicken. Tell folks what's in this uh, building. Okay. When you first walk in, you walk into a little foyer, but right to the right of the foyer is our coffee shop. And our coffee shop is a full-service coffee shop. It's um, got anything that the little green shop has, we've got it too. It's got Wi-Fi. It's got beautiful tables. It's got beautiful dining room tables that people have donated. And then um, if you go beyond that, we have a meeting room. The meeting room can hold over 100 people. Beside that, we have a music room. And the music room is just a place where people go and jam. And we have um, two pianos in there, four guitars, a flute, melanome, um, drums. We've got a full drum set. It's a pretty cool room. And people, all the time, you just say, hey, you want to go jam? And all of a sudden you hear this beautiful music coming out of it. And I'm like, how do they do that? But they do it. If I was looking to buy or sell a house, I would always think about who was my real estate agent and what were their results. Well, Johnny Walker and Kerry Cox hire the best real estate agents out there. Here's Elizabeth Denny to talk about one of her recent clients. A, a teacher and a veteran who were buying their first house. And it, they've, they've actually made fun of me because they said that I, I talked them out of absolutely everything that they wanted to buy and insisted that they wait for the right thing. But I, I feel like when you, when you work as hard as they do and you have jobs that are as important as they have, our job is to be a good steward of their money and their future. So please, if you're buying or selling a home, check out Johnny Walker Realty at 262 Church Street, just down from the Marietta Square. Give them a call at 678-626-0403 or check them out online, johnnywalkerrealty.com. Do you ever sing? Is that what you went to school for, singing? I did, and, and I have gone in there. and we, I've jammed, yes, I have. But um, then we have a computer lab and resource library. And in there, you know, you might find people um, making a resume, looking up a job application, filling out a job application, looking up jobs, touching base with family through Facebook or email, whatever. We have a full service kitchen. We have an arts and crafts room where we make a lot of arts and crafts. And then we have a full-service gym and a full-service game room. Mm. And then downstairs on the 10.5 thousand square feet bottom, we have a thrift store. It's a very, very nice thrift store. Mm. In fact, people from the Classy Flea come over and they tell us all the time, this is the best kept secret in Marietta. (laughs) So they love our little um, thrift store, but... The best thing about the whole facility, Bill, is that every single thing you see in this facility was donated. Mm. We didn't buy anything to go in here. 
Or is it from families, businesses? Who all's uh, been involved in creating this center besides you guys? I think everybody in Cobb County. We call it the house that Cobb built. But we had, um, like all the office furniture that you see, the beautiful office furniture was done by Envisions. They're a furniture company, one of the leasing models. We've had families donate things. The, the music room is filled up, by and large, by people who have lost their children and didn't have anywhere to send their most prized possessions, which were their instruments. Mm-hmm. When they saw the zone, they're like, this is where it needs to be. This is where they would want it to be. Mm-hmm people work out all the time and they have the best intentions putting those workout rooms in their homes and then they find oh, out right. that you know they've, they're they getting a new addition or they're running out of room or that they just didn't use it like they thought they were going to use it a lot of the beautiful pieces of equipment that we have end up right here because of that yeah we've had three pool tables single slab, nine foot, I mean, beautiful pool tables, two foosball tables, ping pong table. We've got theater seating, a 60 inch television. We've got it all. And that was our goal because so many people who suffer with the disease, when when they're suffering inactive addiction, a lot of times they're asked to leave their homes and not come back. During that time, they have nowhere to go that's home. Our dream was when we opened those doors and they walked through, they would see home. And so we painted with the gold tones and, you know, we put the carpet down and put the beautiful dining room tables in the coffee shop and, you know, the the beautiful living room furniture in front of the TVs. And everybody comes in here and says, wow, I had no idea. It's a beautiful place. It's, it's just really beautiful. Mm-hmm. So tell me about some of the stories of the folks that come here and continue with their uh, sobriety or uh, really get sober here. We have over 2,000 visits a month through the doors. A lot of those visits are repeat visits because once people get connected here at The Zone, They just feel like they're a part of something that's so special. Many of them, many of them will come up and say, I would have never made it through early recovery without this place. And those are the people who come in every single day. There's one little girl that I love to tell the story because I was the one sitting at the front desk when she walked through. And she walked in and you could tell she was scared. She was scared to death. Honestly, I wasn't quite sure if she was in recovery or not because um, she was so scared. And I looked at her and I said, are you okay? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, are you in recovery? Because we protect the people in recovery here. And if somebody is not safe, we ask them to leave and come back when they're when they're in recovery or when they're safe because they can trigger other people who are here to be safe and sober so she said yes she was sober and I said well then let's talk let me show you around let's talk whatever we sat down and she said this is my last chance if I don't get sober I won't be able to get married and my life will be over And I said, well, then we've got to keep you sober. (laughs) This past October, she was married, and she's living a wonderful life. She is a wonderfully talented artist, and she is just an amazing lady. Mm. Those are the kind of people that come to the zone, and they come almost to the point where they're ready to just put their lives in your hands. And that's a scary thought because that means that we got to be on top of our game every single day. It's almost like on that knife edge, right? Like you talked about your son with that bottle in the medicine cabinet. It was that you got to be there at the right instant. Exactly. But so many people will just tell you flat out, this place saved my life. They saved their own lives. But we would like to think that we gave them a a really nice place to save their life with. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the big picture and what the need is. And Marietta, I know intervention, but do you have any numbers that 
kind of talk about how bad the opioid problem is here locally? Unfortunately, in 2016, Cobb County had the second most overdose deaths of anybody in the state of Georgia. The only county that had more deaths than Cobb County did was Fulton County, and we all know that's the home of the bluff. So, but if you if you do it percentage-wise based on the amount of land and all that kind of stuff, Cobb County was so close to being number one. And a lot of that is because Cobb County is by and large a wealthy county. The suburbs of Atlanta, that's where a lot of the heroin is going. And it's fentanyl now, too. So there are kids with means to be able to get what they need. And unfortunately, that that plays into what has happened. But um, Georgia is the 11th state in crisis, the 11th from the top. Number one, I believe, is West Virginia. And then Georgia is number 11th with the, the crisis, the epidemic. We need to turn that around. But I did see yesterday, I'm very good very good friends with Nick Adams, and, and Nick is with Fire and Rescue with Cobb County. You know, we opened in 2016, about the middle of the year, and Nick and I became very good friends. And Nick is the one who tracks the stats for overdose calls, 911 overdose calls. So I was looking at something the other day, and I was getting ready to present to my board, which we had a board meeting yesterday morning. And for the first time, I looked, and in 2017, the the 911 overdose calls had actually gone down from 2016. And I would love to think that the Zone and the Davis Direction Foundation had a part in that because, you know, the Davis Direction Foundation actually has five components. We do awareness, prevention, education, harm reduction, which is getting the Narcan into the hands of at-risk families. And then, of course, the re- the recovery piece, which is the zone. Explain what Narcan is real quick for folks who don't know. Okay. Um, Narcan is the reversal over the overdose reversal drug. So if you are dying of an overdose and you get the Narcan in time, it will bring you back and completely kick the opioid out of your body. So we do give those out for free at the zone to families that are at high risk. To be able to see that number come down, and it was just the slightest bit. But it was going in the right direction again, you know, and um, that was that was very powerful, very powerful. But it does sound like you have a message of hope, and this is a center of hope for our city and county. But what would you tell a family, a mom like yourself that might be listening to this in terms of, uh, you know, their son or daughter just seems out of control with this disease? What would you tell them? Not to be an enabler, but to understand the difference between enabling and turning your back. Mm -hmm. To enable is to like hand cash to them or hand car keys to them and those kind of things. But to turn your back is um, to say, I don't love you anymore. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's this meme that goes around and it says, don't hate the addict, hate the disease. And, you know, those are our children there, and no more would we hate them if they had diabetes or cancer, and we can't do that if they have the disease of addiction either. Mm-hmm. Understand what it means to enable and understand what it means to support because you always want to support them. A hundred percent you want to support them. Enabling is the worst thing you can uh, but I'll challenge you on that because a lot of times they're going to lash out at you, right? Because they're trying to work you. They're trying to get some more of that opioid, and they're going to try to use you. And that must be really difficult for a parent to hear that. You know, you you caused me to do this. You have this problem. That's what. That's why I'm doing this. So it's hard not to <laughs> empathize with parents trying to go through that, too. It is, but that goes back to what I just said about don't hate the addict, hate the disease. 
And that's the disease talking every single time. You know, Bill, there's not one kid out there that I've ever met that said to me, oh, I wanted to be an addict. That sneaks up on you faster than anything in the universe. It just puts you in a vice grip. It's impossible almost to get out without help and support. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the zone is. We're the help and support. And um, we're open every day from 9 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. We do phone support. You can call here. You can talk to a recovery coach. You can get all kinds of resources and, and services here. The zone is actually run by peer support specialists, which means that these people have come from addiction into recovery. And so they've been there, done that. You can't tell them anything that they don't know and haven't experienced. And they can tell you not not only what helped them and how they got out of it, but there's usually somebody around who has had prior experience with the particular pathway that somebody else has chosen. And we do believe in multiple pathways to recovery. We're not just 12-step. We're, we're all recovery, smart recovery, celebrate recovery, faith-based recovery. Whatever it takes to get you well, we're supporting. That's somewhat unique too and and a very new concept in the past so many people have been total 12 step Mm -hmm. and if you didn't want to do 12 step then there was really not a place for you to get good help and if that means that you get up and you read your bible every morning and you pray to god to stay clean then you are welcome to come here and get the support you need to to be able to do that just as anybody who comes in with a 12-step book in hand and knows the principles and the traditions and everything else and practices those and goes to those meetings whatever you need to support you in your recovery we're going to go that extra mile and make sure we have it sounds like just talking to you for this uh, short amount of time it seems like you would have other plans on the horizon do you have any uh, plans besides maintaining what you have here I'm glad you asked because we are hosting our first national conference called Building Communities of Recovery in September of this year, and it'll be at the Marriott Atlanta Hilton, and it's um, September 26th through the 29th, and we're going to be talking about solutions. And that's that's a different concept. Most other people are talking about the addiction and, you know, how it happens and that kind of stuff. But we're talking about innovative recovery solutions that are working. And um, we've had people call from all over the nation. And um, last this past week on Wednesday, Tuesday evening, I'm sorry, the Board of Commissioners in Cobb gave us a proclamation proclaiming that we were a local state and national role model for recovery. So we're very proud of that, and we're very proud to be putting together an amazing conference. And I shared a dream on Facebook the other day, and a dream like a, a an awake dream, not a, not a nighttime dream, but an awake dream. And that dream is, you know how you ride through any town, and you see those golden arches, and you know you can pull in and get a hamburger and french fries. Because that's a, that's a national symbol. My dream is that one day you can look and you can see that green double D dove flying in the air up above a building and know that building is safe and sober and it supports recovery any time of the day or night. Wow, isn't that amazing? And it sounds like that you really grew up from the grassroots, which to me... Doesn't, you haven't mentioned the government or any other institution. And to me, that's very powerful. Cobb County built this place. And, you know, there's I've heard so many people say this, but um, if it can't be done in Cobb County, it can't be done. We've done it here, and we've done it well, and I think we've done it better than anybody else. And so one of the things that we'll be doing at this national conference is teaching people from all over the nation how we did what we did to build this community that supports recovery so beautifully. Great. And uh, how can folks get a hold of you, uh, Missy, and uh, find out more about the zone and donate and all that good stuff? We have a website. It's davisdirection.org. 
And um, you can read all about us there. There is a link to the zone. There's also a link to our new conference website, which is www.buildingcommunitiesofrecovery.org. And the phone number here at the zone is 770-693-5982. Great. We'll have all that in the show notes. So it's been such a pleasure, and I'm honored to be able to speak with you and all the great things you're doing for our county. Thank you so much for having me again. And, you know, I'm just so thrilled that we're able to let everybody know that here at The Zone we're supporting recovery, whatever it looks like. Everybody, thanks for listening to Marietta Stories podcast. We have over 36,000 downloads. And if you wouldn't mind, tell a couple friends about the show. You can go to the podcast app, the purple app on your iPhone and listen to it in the car or mowing the lawn or whatever. One more thing, give a review on iTunes. It really helps the show. 